We've been in this series talking about the overcomer. Pastor Mark has covered the first three series, first three messages. He's talked about the attitude of an overcomer. The attitude of an overcomer realizes that there is going to be adversity around us. And if we don't have adversity, there's nothing to overcome. And we were to called to be overcomers. That means we need to face the adversities. Then we looked at the failure principle and how there's failures, failures all around us, but the failures are the stepping stones to our successes. And from my perspective, I'm thinking, man, I am going to be the most successful person in the world because I'm constantly failing, constantly forgetting things, always making mistakes. I am destined to be f- successful if I respond properly. It's not just a guarantee, but I have to respond properly, right? I have to respond to the ways of God. Then the last message had to do with a worthy adversary. And that was the fact that there are battles all around us, but we need to choose the primary battles. Which are the ones that we need to focus on? Which ones do we need to put our attention into, put our energy into? Because those are the key ones that we need to fight and apply ourselves diligently to. Today, I want to talk about the power of prayer. God does not just leave us on our own. He doesn't just say, There you are, go fight your battles, and he watches. He's actually watching, though, but waiting. He's waiting for us to call upon him because he empowers us with prayer. There's something about prayer that he says, I am giving you a weapon. I am giving you a source of strength. And when you don't have the strength, I am giving even the working of myself that goes beyond what you're able to do. And that comes about by prayer. He doesn't just sit and wait, but he does wait until we pray. There are some things that God will not do until we pray. He says, come on. He's waiting. Come ask me. Ask me. Go. And we're waiting. Come on, God. Do something. Do something. But he's waiting. Ask me. Come on. Ask me. Ask me. Come on. Ask me. He's just waiting for us to pray. And if we will pray, then great results will take place. Scripture for today is found from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And let me give you a background history to that. In 1 Chronicles, we have the life of David. David comes towards the end of his life, at the end of 1 Chronicles, into there's a little bit of overlap with 2 Chronicles. And in 2 Chronicles, David passes away. One of the things that was on the heart of David is he wanted to build a temple where the ark and the presence of God could abide. Uh, he's only dwelling in a tent up to that time. And so he said, God, I'm going to build a temple. And God says, no, you can't build a temple because you've been a man of war. He says, but I will let your son build the temple. And so David, as the end of his life is coming, he purposes that he is going to enable his son Solomon to build this massive temple. So he amasses the wealth, gathers together the resources, the wood, the stones, the silver, the gold, the bronze, the materials, so that when Solomon becomes king, Solomon can build the temple and the Ark of the Covenant can be moved in. Solomon builds the temple. We find that in the first couple chapters of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, he has built the temple. Temple. He's sacrificed animals. He's laid everything. He's brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And then Solomon prays a prayer. Now, God had spoken to David, and, David, and God had said, you cannot build a temple, but I will enable your son to build a temple, and in that place I will dwell. Though I do not dwell in, I am greater than, you know, I'm in the heavens can't contain me, but I will be there in a special way where you can meet and commune with me. And so Solomon build, prays this prayer, and he says, oh God, he says, oh God, if there is a dispute between two people, and they turn to this, your temple, and they remember your name, and they call unto you, and they say, oh God, would you intercede? Would you bring a perspective into this situation? God, would you hear their prayer? And then he says, and God, if we are in defeat, the enemy has defeated us and taken us captive, if we would remember our sins, if we would remember our transgressions, if we would remember your name, and if we would turn ourselves and humble ourselves and pray and call upon you, God, would you hear and deliver us? Then he says, God, if there has been a drought through the land, and maybe because of our sinfulness or our rebellion, there is a drought and there's no rain, then God, if we would remember you, if we would call upon you, if we will humble ourselves and pray, then God, would you hear and do something, oh God? Then he lists other things. He says, Lord, if there's a pestilence, if there's a disease, if there's a famine, if there's mildew, I mean, who doesn't have mildew in their house? You know, the showers and all this stuff. If there's mildew, he says, if God, in those situations, situations, we realize that we are a sinful people, that we have erred and fallen away from you. In the midst of these struggles, oh God, if we look unto you, if we call upon your name, would you hear, oh God? He says, what about the stranger, God? 
If there would be a stranger comes to Jerusalem, they're from another nation, but they hear about the nature of God. They hear about the glory and, and the fame of you, O oh God. If they would turn to you, to this place, call upon your name, God, would you hear them? God, if we're going to battle and the enemy's besieging us or we're going into battle and we need your help and we need your strength and we need your power, oh God, if we would remember your name, if we would look to this place and call upon you, then God, would you hear and answer, oh God? And Lord, then he says, and to tell you the truth, we're all very sinful. This is my Eberhard paraphrase, sorry. But we're all sinful. We bungle. We make mistakes constantly, oh God. But Lord, if we would humble ourselves, if we would look to you, oh God, if we call upon your name, would you not answer and hear? And would you deliver us and help us? He finishes his prayer. And then the fire of God and the glory of God comes from heaven down into the temple. The sacrifices that they had laid out, they had not yet lit them, the, the fire underneath. But fire of God comes and burns the sacrifices. The glory, the very presence of God comes into the temple to such an extent that it says the priests could no longer minister. They could not come before it. They just knew that God was there. God was there with his power, and I dare not get close because of my sinfulness. God was there, and they did not dare to enter into the temple because of the the presence of God. And then in that context, that ends off 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And then 2 Chronicles chapter 7, God answers. And he speaks to Solomon, and we're just going to catch one verse there in verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And God speaks, and he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. He says, if my people, if they'll humble themselves, that means, that means, you know, we can't, we realize, I can't do it on my own, I don't have enough strength, the struggles are too great, the battle's too great, I can't do it, God, I need your help, if we'll humble themselves, and if they'll just seek me, then I will hear from heaven. If there's sin, if you turn away from their wickedness, then I would hear from heaven and I would heal their land. There is a powerful statement here that God is saying. He's saying that if you will call unto me, things will take place. I will there be there. I will help you. You're fighting the enemy. You're overcome. Struggles all around you. But if you look unto me, I will hear and I will set you free. I'll deliver you. Do you know what? We have struggles all around us. We're called to be overcomers, but we can't do it on our own. But God says, if you will seek my face, if you'll humble yourself, if you will pray, I will hear from heaven and I will bring healing to the land and to your situations. What a promise. What a powerful statement. And the New Testament writers were not oblivious to that. When you look through the scriptures, all through the New Testament, each of the different writers, each of the different authors spoke about the power of God and the necessity of prayer. And they would beg and say, pray for me, pray for this, pray for that. In the Gospels, we find out that Jesus speaks and he says, if you would pray, if you would agree together, it will be given unto you. If you will pray in my name, it shall be done. If two of you shall agree together, it shall be done. In the name of Jesus, greater things, Jesus said. In my name, greater things would take place. In Acts chapter 6, the church is huge, over 3,000. Multitudes are coming to the Lord. The apostles are laboring, working here, trying to do all this stuff. There's so much needs to be done. And then they realize, we've got to pray. We've got to pray. There's the power of prayer that we need to apply to our lives. We've got to pray. We've got to pray. And then he said, you know, there's so much work. We need to appoint deacons to serve at the tables, to help with the widows. There's the Greeks and there's the Jewish ones. There's the old and the aged. There's the ones with little children. We need some people to serve because we need to pray and study the word of God. Why? Because they realized the power in prayer. That for the battles that were before them, the struggles that they were walking through, prayer was a necessity. Then we read in the book of Revelation, and it says that God was collecting those prayers. God was taking those prayers, putting them in a vial. And it was like, wow, the people called unto me in prayer. He saved the prayers. It was like an incense, a sweet savor unto God. Wow, the prayers of the saints. He saved them all. 
It's like a hope chest with love letters, except they were prayers. He kept them all. Prayer was a key thing in the kingdom of God. It was a key thing. And in our lives, we're supposed to be people of prayer. It's interesting, you know, that uh, even the atheists pray. You see, the atheists pray? Yes. Even the atheists in the right situations. I was, uh, 1980, I moved to a small community of Kenora, Saskatchewan. Started a church there in a Christian school. And in the community, there was a Kenora supply store. Kenora supply store, it had everything. It had blocks of cheese. You could cut your own cheese. It had uh, cake mixes. It had saws and axes and handles for your axe. It had dyes along the wall where you could dye your own fabric. It had rolls of thread. Everything you would want. I mean, it was just a general supply store that had everything. It had salt and pepper shakers and dishes. Just a little bit of everything. One of the runners of the store, his name was Joe. I think it was actually Joseph, but they called him Joe. Uh, it was a Ukrainian community, uh, a Dukabor, Russian community as well. But Joe had served in World War II. I think he's, oh, sorry, World War I. I think it was probably in the German side. And he, when I came into the store the first time, I was looking around. He said, you're new here. Well, the community is 2,600. You kind of get to know everybody. I said, yes, I pastor in the church here. He said, oh, you're a pastor. Then he started to tell me about the story of his life. He said, when I was young, he said, he said, I was in the infantry. He said, I went through boot camp. I went through the training. And then I was sent into the trenches of the war. And he said, there were atheists, those that mocked God, said, there's no God. And they laughed at my faith. He was a uh, Ukrainian Catholic, I think it was. And he said, they would laugh at my faith. We said, but then when the machine guns were shooting, and the mortars were exploding all around. And there were wounded bodies in the trenches and dead bodies in the trenches. He said, those who were atheists, all of a sudden would start to cry out. They would say, Mein Gott, which is German for my God. He said, the atheists would not believe that there's a God. But in the time of desperation, when they realized that they did not have enough strength, they did not have the capacity to make it ahead, they realized that they needed a resource that was greater than themselves, and they would say, my God! And they were not making some Facebook expression, oh my God, you know, look what happened here, OMG, wow, we look what happened to me, you know, my house was transformed, oh my God, look at this room, can hardly wait to, oh my God, look at that, they were calling out, oh God, because they needed the power of God. See, there's something about prayer. There's something about realizing that we're at the end of our lives and yet, or at the end of our situations and, and we need something that's going to power us so we can make it through and that's the power of prayer. So what I want to do is, I mean, everybody knows about the importance of prayer. You know that prayer should be, you should be praying. You know, I don't want to condemn you in any way that way because we all know we should be praying more. But sometimes we miss the reality of what's available to us. And that's what I want to talk about and stir. Matter of fact, I want to kind of give you a pep talk. And my pep talk, is, and my pep talk has three points. And so my pep talk has to do with personalized. That's the P for pep. It's personal. And it should be energizing. Our prayer should be energizing. And the last P for pep should be persistent. And these are three attributes of prayer that I want to talk about. First attribute has to do with it should be personal. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. The disciples come unto him and says, Lord, Master, teach us how to pray, even as John taught his disciples how to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. He was talking to the 12 disciples. He says, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. In heaven. And he was saying, Your prayer should be personal. There should be a connection. It's, it's you and God. It's, not, it's just not their God. It's not your God, or Pastor Mark's God, or somebody else's God, but it's my God. My God. And you know, it's interesting in our culture that people often use the name of God in vain. I worked on a construction crew in my early years, trying to go through university. Then I worked on a stucco crew just before I got married. And it was interesting how people, knowing that I was a Christian, would often use the name of God. And they would rise up in anger, and they would say, Jesus Christ, can't you do any better than that? <sighs> or God, what are you doing, Keith? Come on, smarten up, you dummy. Or they say, geez, what's wrong with you? And they would, I, no, I'm just quoting them, okay? <laughs> 
I'm, I'm not, I'm just quoting. I'm not taking his name. But they would use his name in vain. But there was no connection with God. There was no personal relationship because when they were in struggles, when they would be in difficulties, they'd come up to me and say, well, Keith, could you, um, could you offer a prayer to the man upstairs for me? They wouldn't say, could you pray to God for me? They couldn't even say God. They said, could you, could you just kind of talk to the guy up there for me? How about, how about talking to the, the big guy, you know, on my behalf? They couldn't say, could you pray to Jesus for me? Could you talk to the Lord to me, for me? They couldn't say, could you pray to God? Because they couldn't use those phrases because they could use them in swearing. But they had no relationship. There was no personal connection with that God. And so they knew that there was something missing. They knew that there was a distance there. And so it was reflected in their very verbosity when they're angry and then when they needed prayer. There was no relationship there. Well, what would bring about a relationship with this God? Well, after every service, we say, you know, we're going to give you an opportunity. If you would like to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, that would be a good thing to start a relationship with this God. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. You say, you know what, I've done many things wrong. And you can say, Jesus, would you forgive me because our sins have separated us from God. That would be a good thing to start a relationship. You say, well, then I'm going to go to church. That would be great. But you know what, that doesn't really, it starts a relationship. It doesn't make a relationship. If I were to ask my fiance, and I did, Susan, back 40 years ago, a little bit over 40 years ago, I said, would you marry me? And she said, yes. And in September, we'll be celebrating our, uh, I'm sorry, October, we'll be, got to get this right, Keith. <laughs> Whoa. Hope she's not online with me now. <laughs> in October, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary. But so, 40 years ago, not quite 40 years ago, yeah. For a person who forgets special dates like that, it's a miracle we're together so long. <laughs> But so I asked her, I said, will you, will you marry me and come and join my life? And, and she said, yes. And we got married and then we lived together. I, I, I got the order right. And then we had sex, by the way. Uh, just so that in case you're wondering, how did your order work out? I got engaged. I got married. She moved in with me. And then we had sex. That's, I think that's the biblical order. Okay. In case you're wondering, young people out there, you're wondering what's the order here. I'm just letting you know. So she did that. But so, so we're living together after being married. Okay. We're living together. And uh, does that mean we have a good relationship? No, it means we're living together. Okay. I'm talking. Now it's your time to talk because otherwise I bore you with my talking. Uh, what makes a good relationship? What, makes a, what's, what are some attributes that are necessary for a good relationship between a guy and a, and a girl? I mean, if you're gonna have a good relationship, what, what's required? Communication. What's well, communication? So he said communication. Yes, talking, communication is good. Time together, spending time together, that's good, yes. Trust is important, right, because there's, there's a certain, you know, I, I, well, you know, when I got married, I said, okay, you're taking on my name, the Eberhard name, whoa, 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 you know, but not just my name, I gave her my bank account, well, she gave me her bank account too, you know, uh, but there was a trust there, could I trust her with my money and my name, and could she trust me with her money? Uh, I didn't get her name, but I got her body, <clears throat> could I... <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> could, I, could I trust her? And could she trust me? What else makes a good relationship? Love. Love's important. And it's not, you know, if you want to know if he loves you so, it's in his kiss. That's where it is. Oh, yeah, it's in his kiss. That's where it is. Hug him and squeeze him and hold him tight and find out what you want to know. You know what? It's not that. That's back from my 70s. Sorry. It's not that the true love that's necessary is the agape love that the Bible talks about, which is a sacrificial love. Do I love her enough that I'm prepared to sacrifice my time and my energy and my desires wanting the best for her? And does she love me enough that she's prepared to do that? It's not just in the kiss. What else? 
You build each other up. That's right. You speak well of each other. You think well of each other. And when they're discouraged, you're there to pick them up and say, come on, we can do this. God's on our side. He's going to help us. Come on. You build each other up. What else? You protect each other. That's right. That means there's difficulties in their mind and all around, and you're there to defend them. I'll talk about that in a minute. What else? Prayer. What was that? Prayer, respect. Respect's important, yes. Do I respect enough them enough that I will listen to them and I will, I will honor what they're saying and value it? I'm not just the head of the household. Listen to me, woman. You know, I need to, I value her perspective and I want that. What else? Acceptance. What's that? Acceptance. Acceptance. That means in their flaws and in their weakness uh, that they can, they can be there. Somebody said communication. They're sharing what's happened in their life. They're sharing the struggles of their day. And I accept them. I value them. I trust my spouse enough that when they've shared, you know, this happened and this happened. I'm not going to go around the corner and say, do you know what happened to my wife today? I'm not going to blab it. I hold these things precious. She's lifted her life into me. She's entrusted that to me. There's this intimacy. And when I talk about intimacy, I'm not just talking about sex. I mean, lots of people just say, well, sex is all you need. No, there's a true intimacy where I share my heart and my life with her. And she does the same. And we encourage and we build up and we respond well to each other. And that's what a relationship is. And if we're going to have a personal walk with God then we need those same attributes in our walk with God. That we're able to come before him and say, God, you know, this was a miserable day today. This happened and this happened. And we're not complaining to him. We're just sharing our day with him. And he listens and he knows. As a great father, I know exactly what you're going through. My son has gone through stuff like that too. They rejected him and they spit at him. They actually did worse things. They nailed him to the cross. I know what you're going through. He doesn't mock us. He doesn't push us aside. But he cares for us because he loves us. And those attributes that make a good, healthy relationship in a marriage are the same ones that make a healthy relationship with God. It's not just that we come before him and we give our wish list. Blah, 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 this, But we actually open our lives up to him. We're vulnerable with our great God. And that vulnerability actually develops a relationship. And out of the relationship, then we can pray and we can say, my God, my Father who is in heaven. And there's a closeness there that gives power to our prayer. Now sometimes, you know, what happens in our relationships, and let me just backtrack just before I, I comment here. When we look at the scriptures, by the way, Jesus had this relationship. In Mark chapter 14, as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's about to be crucified, and he's talking to God. He's praying. The scripture says, he called out, and he says, Abba, Father. That's like he's saying, Daddy. You know, this is going to be happening. Daddy, is there a different way that could be done? He was so close. Abba, Father, Daddy. Daddy. You know, we would say, you know, if our little child just starting to talk, said, Dad, Dad. Oh! He's talking, say it again. Come on, say it again. Dad, dad. Oh, we're so happy. Well, in Hebrew, they speak left to right. No, they read, we read left to right. They read right to left. So maybe it comes as Abba instead of Dada. I'm I'm not certain. But they, same primal sound, same simple Abba, Abba Father. And Jesus had this closeness with the Father. He was so close. He wasn't some distant God. He was, he was Daddy, Daddy. There was this relationship that was present. But the scripture says, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, of Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Romans 8, verse 15 says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. When you became a believer, there wasn't the spirit of bondage and fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. You're brought into the family by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You as believers have the same opportunity to come before God and say, Abba, Father, Dad, Dad. What a powerful thing that is. And then it says in Galatians 4, verse 6, because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because we have this close relationship with him and receive help in the time of need. But you know what? Sometimes what happens is we don't, we don't have this closeness. And we don't feel that we're comfortable speaking with God. 
I was raised in a Lutheran background. My mom and dad were, went to Lutheran church. They were very involved in the church, as much as you could be in a Lutheran church. They went to Bible studies. If there was an extra service, they went to the extra service. If there was something about missions, they went to that. If the things needed to be done in the church, they were all was there serving and doing things. When I was 12 years of age, they went to a conference on evangelism. Lutherans don't do evangelism. I don't know what that was, but just don't. But they went to this conference, and at the end of the conference, they had everybody sit around in a circle and said, now let's pray. Just offer up your prayers to God. Let's, let's pray out loud and just pray. And as it was going around the circle, my dad started to sweat. He realized, I don't know how to pray out loud. As Lutherans, we don't pray out loud. We always read prayers, you know, written in the book, you know, prayer book, written in the liturgy, read it. Pastor would say, blah, blah, blah. And we'd say, Lord, have mercy. He'd say, blah, blah, blah. We'd say, Lord, have mercy. You know, we recite the, the Lord's prayer, but we never said prayers out loud. My dad was so angry. When he got home that day, when we had our devotions, he was so, not so angry, he was so frustrated and, and vexed within himself. We had devotions every, time at, every night at home. We would read a little devotional thought. We'd read a scripture, and in the end, there'd be a prayer, and we'd read the prayer. That's what we did, our family. He said, he said sat us down. He said, we are never going to do this again. He says, I am never going to be embarrassed to, that I couldn't speak out loud. I couldn't even pray out loud because I'd never done. We're going to practice at home. From now on, we're going to make up our own prayers at home. We're going to speak our own things from our own heart. And for maybe some of you, you say, oh, I wish I could pray like, like Pastor Mark does or, or Pastor Aubrey. I, I wish I could pray like that person, you know, but I just don't have the words. And if I had to do it in front of other people, I would, I would just never, I could never do that. But you know what? God wants us to be able to boldly come before God no matter where we are. And maybe for some of you at home or when you're driving home, you need to just start saying, I'm going to start praying out loud. Well, I don't know if I'd say the right things. I don't know what I, what I, you know what, you got to start someplace. Start wherever you're at. Just start. Because you have a call to have a close relationship with your father. Start to exercise and walk into it. That's a good point. You should keep that in mind. If we have a relationship with those that we love or with God, sometimes things get in the way of a relationship. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes there's irritation. Sometimes there's transgressions. And the psalmist says, if I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sometimes the things that we do wrong become a barrier to the line of communication. Let me give you an example. Um, Monday night, I was... My wife and I were sitting around. I said, you know, I'm getting tired. I'm going to go get ready for bed. I walked up to the bedroom, and I was getting ready for bed, putting some stuff away. And about 15 minutes later, there's this thumping noise and this cumpling noise, and then there's, ow! Oh! And then my wife comes storming into the room, says, Keith, why didn't you leave the light on for me? You knew I was coming upstairs. Why didn't you leave the light on? And I thought, that was a good question. Uh, but, uh, I, but, but I was quick to my mind. I thought, well, wait a second. I didn't put the light on. I didn't put the light on. I didn't shut it off. So that's why I didn't leave it on, because I didn't, I didn't use the light. I, I actually have a pretty good sense of direction. And I'm pretty, I have a good uh, you know, night vision. And so I kind of stumble around, and I don't put the lights on. Now I have lots of bruised toes. But you know, I, I just walked up there without. And so she said, but Keith, you knew I was coming up. Why didn't you? I mean, why? Why didn't you think about me? Why weren't you considered enough about me to have left the light on? Or you could have put the light on then. And at least you'd have known that when I was coming up, I would have been, well, didn't you care about my safety? Didn't you care about my well-being that you wouldn't put a light on for me? And you know what? There was, uh, uh, I had no excuse. Now, if I'd have been wise, uh, I'm not wise. If I'd have been wise, I would have said, you know, dear, I am so sorry. I should have been more thoughtful. I should have been more responsible. I should have taken better care of, me, of you. I should have put a light on. Would you please forgive me? That would have been smart. But I, I'm not always the wisest, and I didn't say that. Instead, let me just backtrack. On day before that, we are celebrating our family birthdays. Uh, family birthdays in the month of April, and I'm a, an April baby, and so we were celebrating my birthday and some other children and grandchildren for the month of April, and my wife had gotten me this shirt, not this shirt, but it was a, a short sleeve shirt, and she said, do you like it? And I said, what? Oh. Well, I'm, she said, you can wear this on Sunday on the platform when I'm preaching. I said, on the platform? She says, yes, it's a dress shirt. But it's also, you could wear it casually. You could wear it to work. And I was looking, and she said, but if you don't like it, you can take it back. We'll take it back and get you something different. I said, okay, well, let me think about it. And so 
as I'm putting clothes and hanging them in the closet, this is Monday night, Susan comes up and she's angry because I didn't put the light on. And instead of apologizing, I noticed the shirt that was there and I said, by the way, I think you should take this shirt back because I don't like it. <laughs> and Susan says, Keith, how could you say that? And I'm thinking, I'm just asking her to take a shirt back. All of a sudden, it dawned on me, it's like a tit for tat. Well, you don't like the way that I didn't put the light on? Well, here, take your shirt back then. See that? Take that back. And what could have been a nice little situation, all of a sudden, it was not nice. Now, that night, she slept on this side of the bed. I slept on this side of the bed. I did roll over. I gave her a kiss on the side of the cheek. I said I loved her, and then we kind of slept. There was no way. I, I realized my mind was too confused. I've already stepped into the wrong things and said the wrong things too many times that night. There was no way I could say the proper thing to get out of this mess. Do you know what? I could have been talking that night after that. I could have talked about the weather, what's the meals tomorrow like, what I'm going to be doing on Wednesday, and what the weekend's about. I would have gotten nowhere. No communication at all. Talk, 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 but nothing would have gotten through. Why? Because there was something in between. It was a broken relationship. Tuesday, as soon as I saw Susan, I humbled myself. I realized I have so messed this up. I was thinking a little bit more clearly Tuesday. I said, Susan, I was so foolish. I should have respected you. I should have gone and put the light on. Will you forgive me? I was not thinking about you at all. I was so self-centered. Susan, will you please forgive me? And that situation about the shirt, I, I said, I wasn't really reacting. I wasn't you know, getting back at you. I would never do that. And that's true. I would never react as a tit-for-tat type of thing. That's not my nature. I said, I would never do that. So I said, Susan, would you please forgive me? She said, oh, yeah, I forgave you last night already. Well, you know, I... Like, that's true, she had forgiven me last night, but that didn't mean the relationship was right. I had to do my part. And that's the way it is with God too. Sometimes there are some things that we've just gone on our own way with. I don't care what you want, God, I'm gonna do this. I'll do what I want, you know, I'm just blah, blah, blah. You know what? And yet that gets in the way of our walk with God. And that's why it says in 2 Chronicles, if my people will humble themselves and pray and repent, turn from their wicked way, then I will hear and then I will heal their land. So in relationships, that means there's something personal. That means if there's issues that need to be dealt with, we, we need to deal with that. So there's that aspect. So there's personal. The second point in our pep top is personal. The second thing needs to be energizing. Is your walk with God energizing? If I were to say, come on, let's gather together to pray, you would say, Oh, do I have to? Do I have to pray? Oh, man, that's going to be, oh, God's going to, oh, I don't want to pray. Come on, do I have to pray? You know, that's not the way it should be. Now, when you pray, you come with your list. You say, oh, God, do this, and I really need help in this, and would you please step over here? And Come on, come please, Lord, and I need this, and, and Lord, I need some more money, and please help out. And we've got our list, and we're praying. But that's not what prayer is supposed to first of all be. Prayer is supposed to be that which energizes you. That's what revitalizes you. That which invigorates you. That which empowers you so that you can actually walk out in the times of the battles. If you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus, after he ministers and feeds the 5,000, he has taken the crowds and he has healed, he has taught to them, he has ministered to them. Then he pulls away, he sends the crowds away, he sends the disciples away in a ship, and he goes up the mountain. Why? Now, I would think, yeah, I want to get rid of all these people. He goes up the mountain to pray. And he prays and he prays and he prays. Why does he pray? Because to him, it was invigorating. To him, it brought life. And when you talk with your best friend, when you talk, if you have a good relationship with your father, I don't know what type of relationship you had, but I had a great relationship with my father. I could talk about anything with him. When you come to your best friend and you talk about your day and you talk about the frustrations and you know that you are loved and cared for and they give some insights, they're not preaching back at you. Once I was, my wife shared some stuff to me and I started to tell her what she should do. She says, Keith, I don't want a preacher. I want a friend. But a good friend gives little insights here and there, doesn't condemn with preaching, but just listens and supports and encourages. You know what? Life comes through that. And our prayers need to be such that when we talk to God, we're sharing our heart, not nagging and complaining. We're just talking. And at the same time, we're listening and let him speak to us back. 
and life comes. One of our staff devotions this week, they were just talking about what makes a win for you. And I said, for me, there's two things. But for me personally, a win is when I've heard the voice of the Lord speak to me. You say, well, doesn't God always speak to you? Yeah, he's always speaking to me. You're prophesying this and you've got words and knowledge. That's nothing. That's not what I'm talking about. It's when he speaks to me. When he speaks to me. When his word jumps out in a real way, that brings life to me. And it energizes me, brings power to me in the midst of the tough situations. Because even though I'm a pastor, do you know what? I have struggles just like you do. There's emotional things. There's physical things. There's financial things. There's all sorts of pressures. People say things and do things. And I have responsibilities just like you do too. And I need the power and the strength of God. But God has an energy that's available for each of us as we walk with him in a close way, as we're real and transparent with him. So our prayers are that which energizes. The scripture says, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter three, he says, I am praying that you would be built up by his spirit in your inner man, that inside yourself that there'd be an energy coming, building yourself up. Jude chapter one, verse 20, there's only one chapter in Jude, but verse 20 says that you would be praying that, that he says, being built up, that you be built up as you pray in the Spirit. As the Spirit of God leads you, there's something that takes out. You're built up within yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4 says, those that pray in tongues, they edify themselves. That means there's a building up of themselves. You don't understand what you're doing. I'm just praying in tongues. That's true. But something takes place inside. You're built up. There's strength. There's a power. There's an energy of God that comes to you. And beloved, we need that. We need that in the battles and the struggles of life where everything is sucking life out of you. Everything is condemning you, putting you down. You're not good enough. You don't measure up. And the enemy attacks you on top of that and condemns you. We need the power of God coming, energizing from within, energizing from within, energizing from within. And that's what prayer is supposed to be. Our prayer is supposed to be personal, that personal communication with God. And then it's that which energizes because he's my best friend. And I'm talking to my best friend. I'm not nagging him for what I want. I'm talking to my best friend. And life is coming as he talks back. And then the last point of our pep talk is, yes, it's personal Yes, it's energizing. And then there's a persistent. There's a persistent nature to it. Jesus speaks in Luke chapter 18. He gives a parable. And he says, he spoke a parable to them. This is Luke 18, 1. That men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Why does he have this parable that we're always to pray and not to lose heart? Because we don't always pray and because we often lose heart. He talks about this woman of importunity. He kept asking and asking and asking. And when we've got a right relationship with God, and when we've drawn upon his strength, then we can come with our requests. Then we can say, God, I want you to step in. I want you to minister. I want you to do something here. God, this is on my heart. But first, we've restored the relationship. And then we've drawn strength. From him. And then we bring our requests. James chapter 5, it says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That when you're right with God, your relationship's true. You've drawn your strength from him. Then there's much that's accomplished. It says in the New Living Translation, it says, this is James 5, 16. It says the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. Great power produces wonderful results. The same verse in the message translation says, the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. It's something powerful to be reckoned with. We're fighting a battle. There's struggles all around us. There's struggles that your loved ones have, struggles that your neighbor has, people that you haven't worked with. You say, I don't have any struggles. Well, what about the people all around you? They have struggles. Where are you going to get the power from? The effectual, fervent prayer. Somebody who's in a right relation, who's drawing strength from God, avails much. Prayer is powerful. And he gives it to you. And there's something about the persistence. Do you know why we're persistent? 
because we actually know that when we pray, something's going to happen. The results are going to take place. We're not just talking, talking, talking. It's like talking on the phone, but nobody's on the other end. No, it's not like that at all. We're talking to a living God who we have a living relationship. And he said that if my people humble themselves, they'll call upon my name, humble themselves and pray, I will hear and heal and restore, come with his power into the situations that you're bringing before him. Will you stand, please?